آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ بایکن تریزا تو فری سپیچ دبیت ایس پلیش تا هفی بیوز سو لیت می ستار بای اکسپورنگ سم از مین کنسپس از بوک So what does the term mere civility mean and why do you believe it's important to revisit this concept? Great. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Um, so what I call mere civility in the book, in which is the title of the book, I, I identify it as one possible conception of a broader concept of civility. And so the concept of civility generally I define in the book as A, a conversational virtue meant to govern disagreement in particular between the members of a tolerant society as such. So right, there already there are sort of several parts yeah. to that <laughs> definition and it might strike um, a general listener as kind of more specific than we normally think of the concept of civility, which might be something more vaguely uh, kind of akin to politeness or decorum or something good like manners, that. Good manners, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, good manners. Um, But I argue in the book that actually, uh, conceptually and historically, civility is something more particular and that it means different things in different um, historical and linguistic contexts. So I, I'm, I, my concept of civility is coming from one context in particular, and this is kind of early modern uh, debates about religious toleration in Europe and particularly in England. Um, so right, so that's civility. Yeah. Mere civility uh, is a form of this virtue that sets the standard of um, the standard of civil speech and behavior lower <laughs> than the standard of spiritual goodness. Um, so there, it's 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 inherently kind of relational the way that the way that um, mere civility is conceived. It's saying that the standard of civility must it exists, yeah. but it must exist somewhere lower than the standards we set for spiritual goodness or salvation. So it's a more minimalist uh, concept then. Right. So there's this kind of um, intentional minimalism about it. I mean, when I set out to define it in the book, you know, the definition is uh, as uh, a standard of conversational behavior that's compatible with contempt for others and their <laughs> beliefs. Right. And then again, I mean, again, that might sound strange, but if you think about it, this too sort of conforms to how we think about civility in a sort of more everyday context, the idea of being merely civil to someone as being <laughs> something less <laughs> than we might otherwise offer. So on, on that note then, our sixth principle on religion states that we respect the believer but not necessarily the content of the belief. So kind of in light of this, what are the most important differences between mere civility and civil silence and civil charity, which you also explore in the book? Right. So. Um, The idea that civility could be compatible with contempt, I think, um, is unsettling and perhaps counterintuitive for a lot of people. The I, you know, the, the the pushback would be, well, surely civil behavior of any kind, even merely civil behavior, still reflects a kind of basic respect for the other person as a person. Right, and in your sixth principle, that's precisely the kind of distinction that we're trying to make. We're trying to distinguish between um, the believer, yeah. who we respect as a person, and the content of the belief. My argument about mere civility, um, especially as opposed to other the other kinds of civility that I distinguish in the book, so as you say, civil silence and civil charity, mere civility, I think, recognizes the psychological difficulty of making that switch from persons yeah. to positions. It's, uh, I mean, it doesn't deny the possibility of making that distinction. I mean, I, th I think that's important yeah. to say. But it simply says that a theory or a practice of civility cannot rest on requiring people to systematically make that distinction because it's sort of inevitable that one's condemnation of another's position uh, leads us to question their Something deeper, yeah. Right, their judgment at the very least, um, their reasoning faculties, yeah. their the state of their soul. Very often, um, 
And again, I, I'm not, in pointing out that kind of psychological fact, I'm not therefore endorsing that fact or saying this is a good thing or saying that any other kind of aspiration to transcending that is sort of unwelcome or unnecessary. All I'm saying is that when we're talking about civility, which seems to be a discussion about a kind of a, a floor, not a ceiling, yeah. um, we can't define the concept in such a way that it sort of denies basic psychological facts. So this... Um, leads nicely on to some of our other principles. Now, this may be asking the wrong type of question, but so our first and the third principles state that we are, we, all human beings, must be free and able to express ourselves and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas regardless of frontiers, and that we allow no taboos against and seize every chance for the spread of knowledge. Mm. If mere civility is um, not necessarily a democratic concept or concept um, to aim for, like you say in the book, then what is mere civility as distinct from free speech for? What is it for? Yeah. Right. Um, I would distinguish mere civility and sort of merely civil disagreement. Um, I think it's related to questions of free speech and it certainly, you know, I make certain arguments about, you know, what we think of generally as the free speech position in the book. Um, but I mean, very basically, when we're talking about civility, we're talking about constraints. Yeah. <laughs> constraints on speech. Um, one of the things I argue in the book is that many of the debates, um, certainly I'm coming from the U.S., but I've lived... Um, They've lived and taught now in, in a number of different countries. Many of the debates that we think of as free speech debates, including on university campuses, very often they're not really about free speech at all. They're about different conceptions of civility as a standard that should govern a tolerant society. So this is, I think, particularly clear in the case of a university. Increasingly, universities are aspirationally tolerant societies. Yeah. And so when we're fighting about the limits on spe of speech on campus. It's not really a debate between those who say free speech and those who say against free speech. Yes, exactly. What they're just saying is what should the const what are the conversational constraints um, on the exchange of arguments and ideas. Um, so that's one thing. To say, you know, what is, what is mere civility for? Certainly any kind of free speech argument that would be generated by a kind of account of mere civility is going to be importantly distinct from some of the most familiar arguments in defense of free speech. And I'm thinking here of someone like John Stuart Mill, yeah. these kind of teleological accounts that say free speech is justified for the sake of free truth yes, yeah. or progress yes, yeah. or these kinds of things. Um, mere civility is not teleological in that way. It, again, it's about going to sort of t take a move from um, the political theorist Judith Schlar here. It's not informed by an account of the greatest good, but it is kind of informed by an account of the greatest evil. <laughs> so the greatest evil from the perspective of mere civility that that virtue allows us to avoid is the descent into violence. And um, this is interesting in part because the debate around free speech often focuses on if you are to impose limits on it, who impose limits on right. it, whereas I suppose in that sense, a study of civility is therefore a more realistic, more um, meaningful way of looking at it from the other perspective, isn't it, rather than a, as a maximalist kind of goal to aim for. Yeah, so this is good. I, so in this, in this, um, this puts a finger on what I think is an important point, an important distinction. Um, so when, I, when I'm speaking of mere civility, it's precise, I'm defending a kind of virtue and a kind of constraint or restraint on speech. Yeah. Um, that's right. In a way, I'm foregrounding the ethical, um, not simply for speakers, but for listeners as well. So I think mere civility puts constraints, on, uh, d d d puts demands on listeners as well as speakers. Um, to note that, though, just to return to something you said earlier, there's a way in which mere civility is minimalist. Yeah. Um, but there's another way in which it's pretty maximalist. I mean, the demands that it places on speakers and listeners are quite high. I mean, yeah. mere civility is pretty demanding. Um, but nevertheless, I think that kind of bringing the discussion back to um, a question of ethics.
ethics and sort of what what should I do um, in the context of a disagreement. Um, that that that's definitely part of what I'm arguing. But there's another dimension to this, which is the dimension you allude to, which is well, oftentimes when we're talking about civility or free speech, aren't we talking about what the powers that happen should be to, to be? Yes, yeah, should be constraining, restricting, etc. And um, and I think that that conceptual. I think that that kind of move is in, inherent to the concept. I think that when we when, when we talk about civility, um, you know, civility talk, we're always implicitly talking about the boundaries yes. of our civil society or the civitas, um, and we're talking about the potential, the need for um, sanctions. Yeah. So on on this um, note, this. Um, in, in free speech, 10 principles for a connected world, uh, the norm that is pr proposed is not civility alone, but a combination of robust civility and openness. Mm. So openness without civility may lead to anarchy, but civility without openness is a recipe for unfreedom, um, Timothy Gart Nash argues. So he goes on to say that what we need, therefore, is not just civility but robust civility and the word robust should be understood in here in two senses first robust as in frank and open conversation not mincing words or self-censoring mm. and then we must be able to accommodate frank and even offensive description and articulation of difference within a broader framework of civil disagreement but second he highlights that robustness is a quality of civility itself, um, and we so we need to build a frame that is robust enough to withstand gales blowing through it. So, which touches on many of the themes throughout the book. So, I was wondering, in your opinion, what are the main differences between mere civility and this concept of robust civility, particularly the bit about having a framework that's robust enough? To withstand gales blowing through it. Could you say a bit about what openness means? So, in well, I suppose open discussion, nothing is barred from conversation. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, it seems as though mere civility and robust civility are kind of companion concepts. But I think that, um, in fact, there there might be a quite significant difference, which I want to tease out here. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing I say in the book is that open-mindedness cannot be a criterion of civil disagreement. Right? Yeah. If you want to say that as you know, civility requires that we be open to changing our minds, there again, you know, you've sort of ruled <laughs> ruled out any reason why anyone would ever have a disagreement with someone ever, which is basically because you want to change their mind <laughs> while you're in. Um, but that, setting that aside, it doesn't sound like that's what openness entails here. Um, I think this is the, 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 the important distinction. This idea that robust civility um, has to be, you know, occur in the context of an open disagreement in which nothing is on, off limits, which is related to this idea of taboos. Um, and also that it rejects self-censoring in discussion. Mere civility, and indeed I would say any kind of civility, but this includes mere civility, is also a virtue of discretion. It's a virtue of judgment, of making judgments of person, places, time, yeah. and everything else. And so it's not clear to me that civility and self-censorship are at odds. And in, in, I mean, I understand that there are certain kinds of... Um, certain kinds of self-censorship, and I'm sure they're the ones that Professor Garton Ash has in mind, seem to be a problem for, um, for free and fair discussion or open debate, certainly so. Yeah. But I think we go too far then to say, well, what civility means is just saying whatever happens to come into your head at any given moment. Yeah. I mean, civility still has to be grounded in a sense of our relatedness and, you know, as speakers to our listeners and as listeners to the speaker and to our co-citizens. Um, as much about constraint then as, um, but constraint is not necessarily the same as censorship. Exactly so, exactly so. And I think that this is sometimes where um, kind of 
free speech advocates go wrong right. um, in not being sufficiently attuned to the constraints that they themselves often take for granted. Right, yeah. um, mere civility, I mean, in the book, um, I, you know, I draw out these different conceptions of civility with reference to three historical figures, and um, the, one, uh, the one that we might think of as most closely advocating self-censorship in this extreme sense is Thomas Hobbes, who I say offers an account of civil silence, right? Yeah. We can differ about things without disagreeing about them. Um, and I think there's a strong contrast then between civil silence and mere civility, which says that no, civility matters so that we can disagree, not yeah. that we stop. But nevertheless, mere civility and civil silence have this, this, this quality of discretion in common that says that we still have to make these judgments. Yeah. Um, and I mean, and this goes back again to what we were just talking about, thinking of civility as a virtue. Yes, rather than a... Um, yeah, so um, that um, links onto our second section really, which is um, how mere civility is therefore applied really, how do we um, go about seeking or how do we facilitate this virtue so to speak. So in, in the book you write of mere civility as, as you were saying, as the minimum standard of behaviour needed to keep a disagreement going and you identified three main parts about how much difference we can bear how much uh, must we show in order to make that difference bearable and where we should draw um, the line. So um, in kind of in light of this, um, our second principle states that um, we must neither make threats of violence nor accept violent intimidation. I wanted to ask you further about what distinguishes the minimalist concept of mere civility from a lack of violence and adherence to the rule of law? Mm. <laughs> um, on one view, very little, but <laughs> on another view, quite a lot. So the very little view is something I again alluded to before, this idea that civility has its eye on the greatest evil, not on the greatest good, as this kind of avoiding of dissent into violence and civil war. So I was going to say, do you think that the, the rule of law, so to speak, is the new uh, concordia, so to speak, the new kind of framework in which people agree to comply with, which facilitates mere civility? Or... Um, so I don't, I mean, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, no, I mean, I think that there is a sense, and, and again, this, this is, goes back to kind of the, the history of the concept where civil, civilitas is connected to um, ideas of political order and rule of law in contrast to uncivilized or savage existence, right? The yeah. idea, um, you know, th th this obviously has a huge legacy in, um, in imperial and colonial uh, thought and sort of, you know, becomes the kind of dominant sense of civility in the 18th century. So, you know, I, I want to keep alive that, that sense of the concept. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the, the, coming back to the initial question, I mean, what why is, isn't civility simply kind of peaceableness and obedience to the laws? Because it, it, it requires something, it requires something more than that. I mean, in cashing out the demands of civility, it doesn't simply say, you know, he, I build your fence and respect the fences of your neighbor. Yeah, sure. It says precisely, well, have your fences, but then make sure that you're talking to your neighbor over that fence. Mere civility does demand continued engagement. Um, and so it's not, it's not, t you know, it, it's, it's kind of at odds with indifference, which I think is often kind of offered as, a, as the attractive kind of a, a disposition in tolerant societies. So would it be fair just to go back to what we were saying um, a minute or two ago, that even though it is a minimalist concept, it does have quite heavy demands then. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that, that's right. And, um, and I think that, it, I mean, it's appropriate that it should, again, if we're thinking about mere civility as 
a virtue, <laughs> yeah. um, something to be practiced and cultivated and developed over time. Um, that's exactly right. I mean, one of the things that I try to put front and center in the book, because I think it's so often lost in a lot of um, civility debates and free speech debates, is just how difficult and unpleasant disagreement can be. I think that there are those rare individuals who just sort of thrill <laughs> to debate and disagreement, you know, people who, d who do debate or model UN or whatever, that, you know, when they're in high school. Yeah. You know, I was never one of these people. <laughs> I, I I'm, <laughs> I'm very attuned to, you know, the, the sort of, the fact, um, you know, one of these truths just evidenced by our language, right? The fact that agreeable is a synonym for pleasant. Yes, exactly. And disagreeable is a synonym for unpleasant, right? Um, Disagreement is hard, and diversity is hard. Yeah. Living and working with and interacting with people who are unlike you is difficult. Now, to say that it's difficult isn't to say that it's impossible or unimportant. I think it's absolutely crucial. We, you know, all uh, all good things come. Maybe not all good things, but you know, good it's, things come from this. We're up to the challenge, and but it's a challenge. That also assumes, I suppose, that. A neutrality, I suppose, of agreeing. There, just the alternative of uh, not disagreeing is not necessarily a good situation. If that, right? And I mean, and this is one way in which I characterize the civil silence position. Um, so you know, there's a there's an aspect of this which is kind of just agreeing to agree. A sort of you know, Hobbes will describe this as complacence, going along to get along. Um, but there's also an element of indifference as well, caring less. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a record, and this is, um, and again, very often this is portrayed as the kind of liberal response to difference. It's the sort of, oh, we suddenly realize that religion doesn't matter. Yeah. So tolerance becomes easy. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. There are areas in which I think um, indifference uh, is appropriate. I think that there are kind of gains to indifference, but I'm very concerned that we not conflate indifference with tolerance yeah. or civility, right? Tolerance and civility maintain this sense of um, the persistence of negative judgments yeah. um, and the need for engagement across differences um, without reducing them to matters of indifference. So in terms of the, just to probe further slightly on the kind of conduct of mere civility, so to speak, right. how important do you think that fact checking or the both sides so to speak agree on a certain set of facts is mm -hmm. to mere civility. I this is an you know this is an argument I'm attuned to and I can see the attraction of sort of saying, well, can't we build in certain evidentiary requirements into the standards of civility? Um, no. <laughs> no is the answer. Um, for, for the reasons that make me skeptical of the impartial regulation of civility generally, I think that what constitutes a fact is part of the part of what's under what's under debate. And I think you can recognize that without then being committed to the kind of anti-foundationalist or sort of, you know, just nihilist position that says that there are no facts. I mean, I think that there are facts, but I mean, when I talk about the kind of disagreements, and perhaps it's, it's good to say this here, I mean, in the book I'm concerned with a particular sort of set of disagreements, what yeah. I call fundamental disagreements, which um, are questions of believing and belonging that sort of go to the heart of, of how we see the world and how we see um, ourselves and others um, in relation to the world and, and questions of fact and facticity are, are always going to be in play in those. And of course in the context that you write it's a kind of an extreme case so to speak which is all three writers are largely talking about 17th century theology so the potentially the, the extent of disagreement is far more fundamental than we have today. No. <laughs> um, yes and no. Okay. I think that remembering the 
context wherein these theorists are theorizing civility is essential and noticing that the kind of paradigmatic fundamental disagreement they have in mind is a religious disagreement. Yeah. Um, and to say it's a religious disagreement, I mean, some of those are theological, some of them are ecclesiological, some of them, right. you know, there are all sorts of things that might come under the rubric of a religious disagreement in that period. Okay, yeah. Um, but I mean, it's it's a good example because I mean, let's so let's let's say, well, what's the early modern equivalent of the kind of fact checking criterion? Well, it's the sort of say, well, you know, we have to agree on scripture yes, yes. as the ground on which we're going to resolve that. So, I can point you to the debates that show that that solves exactly nothing. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. So the the um, we I suppose it's very easy to get in a muddle about what we actually mean by facts. And who says right? And who who's the fact credentialing authority right? I mean, for Hobbes, this is why he thinks that we have to have a national church that determines what is canonical yes, yes. with regard to scripture. I mean, so think about, I mean, so, you know, think of the Church of England and that argument as equivalent to factcheck.org. Yes, you know? yeah. Um, I think that in, <laughs> Slightly old, yes. <laughs> with the advantage of historical perspective, we can kind of see the problem more clearly than we can perhaps um, in, in, in our own case. But then this sort of second point that you made that the, perhaps the, the disagreements are more fundamental. I, I wouldn't say so. I think that one of the things that you know, drew me to the project initially was just noticing how, um, how like religious sects, um, political parties can operate. Yeah. Um, in terms of this dynamic of believing and belonging. I mean, one's tempted to make the joke, you know, that's made of academia, right? Say that the, the feuds are so bitter because the stakes are so small. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's a way in which you can sort of look at partisan disagreements in the United States and say, oh, we agree on so much. Mm -hmm. You know, these are really small things yes, that are dividing yeah. us, but it doesn't matter that they're small. The, the, the feeling office, that they're yeah. fundamental mm -hmm. um, is what matters. Uh, and so there, there again, I would, I would say that we can exaggerate the kind of distance. So on this note, this picks up on the point that you were making about somebody can't be independent of the process of mere civility because it is kind of a relative concept between the people that are involved. Um, so you've previously spoken of your admiration for the British parliamentary system so how important do you think having a debate chair, in this case to speak of the House of Commons, is to ensuring civil debate? I, I, mean, I, I don't know that I've expressed my admiration <laughs> yeah. for it. Okay, I sort of mentioned I was putting it. words into your mouth there, wasn't it? <laughs> You've mentioned it in the past, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mentioned it in, specifically I mentioned it in the context of just showing how different norms of political decorum can be in different contexts. Um, so I'm all for reminding us of the um, contingency of, of norms or um, ways of doing things that we take as, uh, take as natural kinds. So in that context, is um, so being a big fan of the parliamentary yeah. system, would you say that one of the strengths of the speaker is that he is kind of off kind, if you like, he is also an MP. Yeah. There's an idea of sort of primus inter paris right there. It's, you know, he's a he's an equal. He's not set up as a kind of external or impartial arbiter, yeah. right? He's a member of the body and he's equally a member of the body. I think that's that's really interesting. I mean, but the other point I would, I would say um, is that I think it's important to maintain um, a set of distinctions here. I mean, so one distinction is to say that civility as a conversational virtue is a particular kind of virtue that, that pertains to a particular kind of context, namely the kind of the context of civil, civil society as a whole. Um, parliament as a particular deliberative body has standards of decorum and the standards of decorum in Parliament are quite a lot lower. Yeah. <laughs> they are much closer to mere civility yeah. than those in the, in, in the United States Congress, for example. 
And so that's, I mean, that that's what I find really interesting. Um, I would still maintain the distinction, though, between decorum and civility in that case. And I, I think you might argue that in a kind of representative assembly like Parliament, it's desirable that the standard of decorum approximate the standard of civility. Um, but they're not the same. But they're still different. Yeah. On that note, is what is the role of satire in the process of mere civility? Yeah. Um, it's something that I've thought... Because it can be something that can ease debate and conversation, but it also can be something that Conflict. people really don't like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it's not something... It's, I don't talk about it directly in the book. I don't really talk about humour all that much in the book, which might say something about you know early modern intellectual history and political <laughs> yeah. theory as disciplines. Um, well, they're, they're, they're talking about heavy topics, aren't they, really? So, <laughs> yeah. I still maintain that Hobbes is the funniest figure in the history of political thought, so maybe, maybe, that, maybe that comes in. Um, I mean, my own view just is to say that mere civility is a kind of, uh, you know, conversation compatible with contempt, you know, that, that com I mean, satire fits in quite easily there. I mean, the objection that people have to satire is that it's contemptuous, mm. um, that it's not simply humorous, it's not simply kind of having fun, it's having fun in a way that degrades or demeans, um, that doesn't treat this kind of other side as equal. Um, I, you know, without weighing in on whether or not that, that, that's an accurate description of what sat satire is and does, I think that an advantage of mere civility is precisely that it says, e even, even if it did that, it doesn't then follow that it's uncivil. So, building on that then, so one of the most important themes I took from the book was the distinction between respect and trust. So. On that basis, should we therefore see mere civility as a spectrum or a process by which trust is built through continual conversation? Ooh, that's really good. Um, you're absolutely right to notice that one of the things I'm really keen to do in the book is 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 avoid and, br and break down what I call the reductio ad respectum, which is. Um, I think it's a move you can see not only in academic political theory, but in um, in public, legal, and political debate more generally, where we sort of turn every good thing in um, in social and political life into a form of respect for persons. Um, this kind of neo-Kantian respect language that sort of you know uh, uh, colonizes all moral or ethical discourse. Um, so I am really keen to distinguish um, mere civility from from the kind of more moralized conceptions of respect that you get in political theory. But this question of trust is really, really interesting, and it's something that I'm, I'm not entirely sure what to, where to come down on it, because I think that um, certainly as you say, mere civility is kind of process oriented, not outcome oriented, but it seems that one of the one of the one of the effects of the process is a kind of inuring ourselves to offense, that's one part of it, but also a kind of getting to know our neighbors. Yeah. yeah. You know, sort of face to face disagreement um, that might I mean, humanize in some cases, but certainly familiarize or, so, you know, it's, I, I don't, I want to hold on to this idea that, that, that familiarity often breeds contempt. Yes. Um, yeah. But something does come, um, that kind of um, emphasis on relation and relatedness. Whether or not that reduces to trust is really interesting. And here I just don't know, I don't know enough of the academic literature on trust to, to have a sense of how it's defined and measured. Um, Locke certainly seems to think that trust is going to require a sense not only of um, similarity, um, and we might think of kind of, you know, just does someone look like me? Yes, do they yeah, speak yeah. the same language as I do? But in terms of a kind of sense of shared commitment or values, yes, yeah. so there's a kind of cognitive dimension we have to, that trust is actually predicated on a kind of um, uh, shared belief. Um, so then it's, uh, I mean, this might be a slightly um, 
bad term, but almost like a constrained disagreement, if you like. Precisely. And the way I describe it in the book is Locke sort of sacrifices difference for the sake of disagreement. He yes, says, yeah. oh, you can have lots of disagreement. Disagreement's great. It's a it's an engine of, uh, of progress. Um, but only if it's sort of kept within certain bounds. And so the way, I mean, so Locke conceives of the kind of consensus required for social trust in a negative way. And you can yeah. see this very clearly in the letter concerning toleration and some of his other writings. He says, we cannot tolerate atheists because we cannot trust them, because they will not keep their promises. Right. Or that we cannot know that they'll keep their promises. I think that's really, really interesting. And you see, a, we, we, you know, someone, a, a modern secular liberal reading Locke's argument will say, well, obviously, that's <laughs> wrong. You know, obviously you can trust atheists. But then you'll see a version of that move being made all of the time. Which in, then adds into the, um, what we were saying previously about civility is uh, historically bound, isn't it? And it's con context bound. So... Um, you could uh, substitute possibly the word atheist for some, some other category today, possibly. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be too um, controversial, but I think, I mean, what are the... You know, it used to be in political theory that the sort of, you know, Locke's atheist... Um, you know, we, we decided that atheists were good people, and so you know, <laughs> yeah. we're all atheists here. Obviously, we can trust each other, but sort of who's the kind of limit, who's the test case? Well, it's the racist, right? Um, you know, and uh, can we tolerate intolerance, which comes back again and again. I think today the category is fascist, right? And so then the, the fight becomes yeah. about to whom can we apply that label? Because yes. once, we've, once we've successfully applied the label, that person is implicitly and explicitly beyond the pale. Yes, yeah. Um, and so I, I think it's just the same it's the same move without weighing in on the question of whether or not it's right or wrong. Yes, yeah. Um, I think just a historical perspective can allow us to see the moves that are being made um, in a general way. So, our third, moving on to the third section, in which um, I wanted to explore a little bit more um, with you about the concept of mere civility in the context of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, um, I suppose my, my first question is, um, we've talked quite a lot about personal relations um, face, and the context we're talking about is people meeting face to face yeah. and so on. So do you think that uh, people being anonymous online um, and communication that's not face to face on the internet helps or hinders mere civility. Yeah. Um, this is something that I go back and forth on. I, I mean, in the book, one of the main things I want to argue, which I think is right, is that we can exaggerate the unprecedentedness of the kind of problems that we're encountering in terms of free speech and civility. Um, given these technological changes in the internet and social media, et cetera. And so I stand by that, right? I mean, you know, whenever we're attempted to apply the label unprecedented to something, you know, we should <laughs> remember Ecclesiastes and Aristotle and say that there's truly nothing new under the sun. So, I, but, <laughs> but I, I do think that there are very clear and indeed measurable and measured ways in which um, the internet hinders merely civil disagreement. Um, I mean, I can give you a number of them, but I mean, maybe one one in particular goes back to what we were talking earlier, which is just that um, when people are engaging anonymously, and, and, and not not only anonymously, but you know, anonymity clearly um, exacerbates this. They lose a sense of constraint. Um, so one of the things that the internet enables is the kind of instantaneous reaction yes, yeah. uh, versus the kind of moment of discretion and judgment that would come into whether or not, you know, what, if you're responding to a person in front of you yes, versus something, just sounding off. Because something might run through your mind and you think, well, I haven't really thought about it. So. Yeah, yeah. So we just, we lose that kind of moment of reflection. And then also anonymity. We lose that sense of a continuous identity over time. So there have been some studies about, um, uh, it doesn't seem that we really need people to engage uh, in debate under their own name. But even if you have them use pseudonyms. Yes, yeah. Um, just so that there is a kind of study identity, it um, leads, yes. it, it makes a difference. 
Um, but the, well, the thing that I think I didn't give enough thought to or didn't take seriously enough in the book that does change with, uh, with internet and social media is the problem of context. So um, just it, these technologies make the kind of discretion that mere civility requires really difficult because um, the audience is unstable. So for instance, uh, I might be arguing with, um, with a friend um, yes, yeah. over, um, over the dinner table or even over, or over text, right? And if someone forwards that text to someone else, the audience has suddenly shifted. What yes. was initially a sort of you know, virtuoso performance of mere civility suddenly <laughs> becomes hugely offensive. Exactly. Um, so it's that kind of instability of the boundaries of the disagreement that I think becomes really difficult and just the the instability of audience and this neatly um, links onto my next uh, thing I was wondering whether you could expand on which was do you think that mere civility can break down because people from outside can undermine the trust in the institutions on which mere civility relies so and as a part of that how important is technological change such as the advent of social media in that process? Um, yes, I mean, so I, I think, you know, not to reiterate, reiterate um, what I've said, but again, you know, I want to sort of bracket this language of trust and the extent to which that's exactly what, I mean, I, I think there's a way in which what mere civility does build is trust, but it's trust that's a kind of practical trust that sort of builds up in the kind of the, the building of relationships over time. Um, and this sense of a shared, maybe not a shared goal, but at least a shared enterprise. I think that that's fair. Um, and I think this is a particularly clear case in which the kind of porousness of the boundaries of discussion can become a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but again, to take a concrete example, we can think of you know th this kind of question of insider outsider is is a is a big a big part of questions about people speaking on um, university campuses. Um, so you know one of the things I think people need to pay more attention to is is precisely this distinction between insider, insider and outsider. It's sort of, so if civility is the kind of standard of um, conversational contact we expect from members of the university as a tolerant society, yeah. um, is it correct then to apply that to non-members who may be invited in to speak? Um, so there's that question, but then also I think that oftentimes people want to make a kind of, make a mistake in saying, well, outsiders are bound to the same standards. What happens when a student group invites in someone who yes, seems yeah. uncivil? It seems to me that's a question of the university's relationship, not with the outsider, but with the students. Mm -hmm. um, students who in invited them, but then also students in the broader community. So I, I think that thinking about, just because the internet sort of, uh, or various kinds of media sort of um, effaces those boundaries for us, practically, actually, we need to yeah. make sure that we continue to make distinctions. So, we've touched on this quite a lot, but um, so our, our tenth, tenth principle argues that we decide for ourselves and face the consequences when it comes to free speech. So, kind of in light of this, what can mere civility teach us about the responsibilities, if any, of uh, so-called private superpowers such as Facebook and Google? Oh, right. Um, so right when you refer to the 10th principle, um, which is it comes under <laughs> courage, I was thinking how, um, again, thinking of a, a kind of virtue approach uh, to the challenges of coexistence, that courage is a virtue that we probably need to think more about. I have a student working on courage, and it's precisely um, this sense, but I was thinking about that in a kind of individualistic maybe not individualistic, but sort of a, as a courage, as a virtue of um, persons. I think that the, um, that the power and significance of these kind of supranational um, private entities is 
it's it's a huge problem. It's a huge challenge um, because the framework, conceptual and sort of uh, legal, etc., for how we think about these problems is remains kind of national. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that this is something that needs a lot more needs a lot more theoretical work in in addition to uh, a lot more policy. Um, my hunch would be that um, even though Facebook and Twitter, for example, are yeah. private entities and so can regulate the speech of their members as they see fit, much like a university, yeah. um, there's a strong, compelling case to be made um, for the civic importance of these platforms for debate and discussion um, that say that you know that the that the state has a has a compelling interest in, in regulating them. I mean, but then what follows from that, especially and I'm coming again from the American perspective, yeah. is to say that that these entities actually need to be held to um, the you know a standard of civility much closer to that of the First Amendment. Yes. Um, so that they, you know, so we have a kind of principle of uh, of of no content based restrictions, um, and I know that 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 conclusion yeah. is at odds with a lot of people who are, are concerned about this question. Um, but I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, it's not my chief concern, but I think that um, it's not obvious that what that a desirable outcome would be private entities and actors who have, you know, significant political lobbying arms should be empowered to system systematically um, distort the media landscape. And on that note, actually, and, and finally, looking, as my final question, looking to the future, you write in the book that in its commitment to tolerating the uncivil speech of, of its citizens, however extreme, the United States remains an outlier, yeah. while defamation, libel, obscenity, and so-called fighting words are generally excluded from First Amendment protection. Speech that is simply offensive or insulting is not. So do you think mere civility will increasingly need to become a glo global concept because of the internet and what do you see as the main challenges it faces? Ooh. Um. I want to insist on the situatedness and boundedness of civility as a conversational norm. So um, in a universe of tolerant societies, civility would be a universal virtue, but it would sort of, the, it's particular, it would be instantiated differently in different contexts still. So, I mean, I, I'm insisting on this because I just think that there, I, I don't think civility can be a cosmopolitan. <laughs> So would it be fair to virtue. say, I mean this is slightly semantic, but that there are civilities yeah. um, and there will be some degree of overlap between them? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I don't think that's, I mean, if it's semantic, you know, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're my kind of semantic pedant. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah I, I think that that's correct. Now, the, insofar as American companies, American norms seem to be as uh, dominant um, you know, in, the, in this context. Um, I think it would make sense that a kind of American free speech fundamentalist culture would sort of encroach um, mm -hmm. or um, impose. You know, I don't think that's desirable because it's American, right? I think that there's a way in which, um, you know, in the book I'm sort of defending, defending, um, offering an account of how the kind of peculiar American way of thinking about these questions came to be and then offering a limited defense of it. Um, so I'm not defending it because it's the way that, you know, Americans do things. <laughs> um, but what I find attractive about the um, kind of American approach to civility is a kind of is accommodating a kind of mere civility is that it seems to me an institutional arrangement that recognizes the inevitable partiality of our judgments about civility and that it's very difficult to, to distinguish systematically and fairly mm -hmm. between the manner of disagreement and the fact of disagreement um, and that's what really worries me um, that if we sort of hold out this power to regulate the manner of speaking 
um, it inevitably reduces to trying to eliminate the fact of certain kinds of disagreements. Yeah. Um, and if what we really care about is the latter, sort of defining which views are beyond the pale, yeah. I would much rather us have a discussion about that yeah. <laughs> than to kind of speciously, you know, forward that agenda under the, under the banner of civility. Okay, thank you. And um, Teresa, thank you for speaking to uh, Free Speech today. Thank you very much for having me. Free Speech.